Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The CST-100 Starliner returned from space yesterday and touched down safely at White Sands Missile Range, bringing to an end a very, very short test mission. The original mission was going to be a couple of weeks. They had to reduce it to a couple of days. So, yeah, deorbit burn happened over uh, southeast of, of New Zealand. Spacecraft slowed down, began to re-enter over Baja, uh, Mexico flew over into New Mexico and people were able to get photographs of the capsule streaking through the atmosphere with flames and ionization heating coming off it. There's some photos from Virgin Galactic showing this. As it slowed down through hypersonic to subsonic, it deployed the drogue chutes, deployed the main chutes, dropped off the heat shield, which uh, of course would land in the desert and was recovered for analysis later. Uh, and then basically sank under its main shield and landed within one kilometer of the target site, which is pretty impressive because things under parachutes tend to go left and right as the wind blows them all over the place. So getting within one kilometer of the target after a deorbit burn is pretty impressive. I, I do have to say that, you know, Boeing does build ICBMs, so they probably know how to put payloads very close to their targets. Uh, yeah, so the accurate landing meant that apparently the spacecraft touched down on a runway at White Sands Missile Range, which was pretty nice. Runway, I think, that the Space Shuttle might have actually used on STS-3. Uh, and yeah, for for the record, Wayne Hale pointed out that the touchdown was 9,000 feet past the threshold and had a rollout of 3 inches, because of course he still thinks in Space Shuttles, and good for him. I, oh, awesome, he's dude is an icon. Yeah, so that was the end of that mission, and in the last hour we've had pretty much the end of uh, Dennis Mullenberger's career as CEO of Boeing. So that just came over the newswire that he has uh, been forced out, stepping down. Obviously, Starliner is not is, is maybe, if anything, it's a very, very small part of a very, very big thing that says 737 MAX on it. And yeah, obviously... Uh, Boeing has been troubled for many reasons. It was interesting to see that the the board did say they were standing by Dennis on Friday, and yet this is what happens on Monday. I don't think that Starliner has anything to do with it, but you know, you never know. So yeah, um, over the last few days, we've also had a few updates on what exactly happened. We did finally get some video from space. We got a you know ten second clip showing the Starliner separating from the Centaur upper stage. And that's nice to have. Um, in the press conferences, uh, it was asked, Boeing, why are you not sharing any video from this? And their response was, well, we thought we would have it all uploaded to the space station and then share it then. Which, well, sure, that's fine, but that still doesn't explain why you never gave us any shots of the glorious return of the dual engine Centaur. The, that, those cameras would have been on the booster and we wanted to see those more than anything. Well, maybe I did. You know, you guys might want to see Rosie the river, uh, Rocketeer on board, you know, sitting around chilling in space. Because that would be pretty cool as well. So, uh, yeah. So after getting into space, after separation, the spacecraft had this clock issue. The current statement is that what happens is when the capsule separates, it then gets its guidance internal navigation state from the Centaur upper stage. It just queries a bunch of APIs. It says, hey, where am I? How fast am I going? And the Boeing programmers apparently took the wrong timer. So unlike normal rocket launches, the Starliner has a mission elapsed timer that can start before takeoff. And the reason is, the Starliner may need to perform abort maneuvers when it is still sitting on the ground. So the timer is running prior to this. There's another timer that they should have read, which presumably says T equals zero for the launch, and that's not what they got. So the timer was reading 11 hours. Spacecraft was in the wrong attitude, doing the wrong things. And because it was making these motions, they were unable to get the t uh, TDRS connection because that required directionality on the antennas and that's why it took them a long time to start getting signals to it. At that time, the mission control team did not use the orbital maneuvering system to put it into the higher orbit, into the stable orbit. They instead used the reaction control thrusters, the attitude control thrusters, because they knew they had control over those. They later, uh, they stated on Saturday that the, um, 
the, the uh, engines had been over, you know, pushed, had been run for longer than they initially had been tested. So this meant that some of them had sensors that started tripping out with thermal and pressure issues because the engines were being run longer and hotter. RCS thrusters are generally pulsed or made for very, very short burns. They were making several minute long burns to change the orbit bit by bit. They were aware that they were pushing the temperature, so they would run them for a little bit and then stop them. But that meant that some of the thrusters actually apparently shut down and there are redundant sets. They obviously made it to their final orbit, made it to this 187 by 222 kilometer orbit. And from there, they were able to then check out the spacecraft, verify that the, you know, the sensors were working, verify that the RCS thrusters were still in good shape. And I believe they, used, they then managed to check that the orbital maneuvering system was running, and that's what they then used to boost it up into the 250 kilometer orbit, where it would stay for a couple of days. Now, some of you have asked, why was it only a two day mission? Because originally it was gonna be several weeks. You know, why didn't they move, move it into a higher orbit so they could have tested longer? And I'll say that the Starliner according to the commercial crew spec, is supposed to have 60 hours of endurance with crew with a full crew. Um, obviously, there's no crew here, but there might be endurance issues with uh, cooling because it doesn't have big exterior radiators. So if it has to do cooling, I imagine it has like an ice sublimation cooler, which will have a limited water supply. Um, power is supplied by the solar cells, and they confirmed that the solar cells were delivering at least the amount of power needed, they were power positive or neutral for the entire flight. Well, like, so, say, you know, over, averaging over every orbit. Obviously, in the dark, they weren't power neutral. But over a complete orbit, it averaged out. So yeah, I, I think the reason simply was that they wanted to get home before Christmas. There was only so many tests they could do. And frankly, they had already over-tested the reaction control thrusters, so they, they get more duty cycles on that in, state, in space than they had intended for the entire mission. So in those two days, they did manage to get plenty of tests done. The PR spin says that they got 85 to 90% of their objectives, which you know, may be correct if you, you know, count things on paper, but I think that some objectives count for more than others. For example, docking with the space station is a big, big, big objective, whereas testing your Snoopy Zero-G indicator works is sort of not that important. But yeah, they were able to test the Vesta star tracking navigation system. This basically is tracking stars and it integrates that with GPS information and uh, inertial instruments on board to correctly synthesize the spacecraft's orientation and location in space. Um, they obviously tested the thrusters, they tested the thermal control, the um, power system, the, uh, they tested the communications with the space station, so they were able to uh, get in, work with the space station and perform maneuvers, including the abort maneuver, which is where the astronauts see the spacecraft coming in too fast and they say, GTFO, there's a big red button that says get out of here, and they tested that. They tested the docking ring, which is, you know, I don't know if you've seen how this works. It's like a ring that sort of comes forward and is supposed to dock with the space station and has the shock absorbers and has a pretty good range of motion on it. So that when the two spacecraft come together, it's not one big jolt, it's a very soft connection and then they pull them together. So they were able to deploy that into space, uh, deploy that from the spacecraft and verify that it all worked correctly. And that is great. Obviously, they then were able to verify uh, re-entry and that all looked good as well. So anyway, it returned, the crew got out and they checked the, the hardware, you know, they bring out a nice cover for it, get inside it. They, they look at the presents and they say, sorry astronauts, you're not getting these until January. Um, they had press conferences. Sunita Williams, who is going to fly in this next, because they're going to take this capsule and refurbish it, you know, reuse it. Uh, she's going to fly on that, which will be the first proper flight to the space station rather than the test first test flight. She got to name the capsule, so they're calling it Calypso. It's a nod to Jacques Cousteau's ship. I also think that Calypso is a cool name because Calypso was a witch that kept Odysseus, and she was... Uh, she was supposedly the daughter of Atlas, which makes it kind of cool that it's actually flying on an Atlas rocket. But of course, that is based on the original planned launch schedule. And with this failure, 
It's entirely possible that that might change. There will be those that argue that not getting to the space station on your mission that was supposed to go to the space station is big enough fail failure that you need to refly this thing. I also see that there will be many people that argue that, oh, we know what caused that problem. We can fix this and we can do simulations. So therefore we should just fix it all in simulations and not do another uncrewed test flight. Certainly the crew, they've gone to great lengths to point out the crew was never in any danger and therefore it is safe to fly crew on the next flight. I, I mean, I, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, this is, you know, Boeing gets preferential treatment, but, um, you know, it's one thing to not get to the space station, it's another to have your capsule explode when the abort system fires. Uh, understandably, none of these are desirable and we want everyone to get flying, you know, crew to space as soon as possible. But I think the way I feel it is that Boeing will probably get to put crew on their next flight. But yeah, you know, we're also going to see uh, the in-flight abort test happen you know, just weeks from now in January, that's going to be great. And then there's a whole bunch of Starlink launches. And later in the year, we should see SpaceX flying Dragon to the space station with crew on board. So one question I was asked after the previous video was why did the Atlas V hold on to its solid rocket motors for 48 seconds longer after burnout? Why would it carry this extra dead weight? And I initially thought this was something to do with making sure that the boosters dropped into a safe area because this is what they did with the Delta II. They would drop the boosters further offshore to make sure it didn't land on any uh, oil rigs or anything like that. And the Atlas V was heading northeast up along the coast. But they didn't do that for the uh, Cygnus launches. So I think actually it's to do with the very low launch trajectory they instead of putting it into a 120 mile orbit they were putting it into like a 70 mile orbit and that meant the spacecraft or the rocket was taking off along a much lower trajectory so at the point when those boosters burned out it was still deeper inside the atmosphere and experiencing much greater aerodynamic forces and under those conditions the atlas team probably were concerned about aerodynamics forcing or causing those boosters to recontact the core and so they elected to hold on to them until they were higher in the atmosphere and then the aerodynamic forces were lower and then they could drop them safely and not worry about uh, them recontacting the booster because of course you know that's the kind of thing that would ruin your mission. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.